This is the word of the Lord our God. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask uh, that this evening you would uh, open our eyes and that we would see uh, wonderful things uh, from your word. And we ask that humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I wonder if you have ever seen uh, the footage of, uh, of the moment where uh, for George W. Bush uh, the American president, George Bush, when, he, when he's told about uh, the attacks of 9-11. Have you, have you ever seen that, that clip? Uh, you can get it on YouTube. He's, he's sitting uh, in, the, in the front of a, of a primary school class. Uh, there's another one of the teachers there. Uh, the children are, are sitting, they're, they're practicing uh, their sentences, uh, practicing words. And off, off the side, a presidential advisor comes up to, to his ear and he, and he whispers in his ear and he tells him that America is, is under attack. And we, as, as the viewer, we, we know what's happening in that moment, but the children and then the teacher, they, they don't know what's happening. Um, but we, we get to watch it in real time as, uh, as Bush, as he processes this information in front of that crowd, as he, as he plans his, his next move, And as as he realizes that what he's going to have to say immediately after that event is is dramatically different uh, than what he had planned. Obviously, the education of children is is important, but his his nation is under attack, and so he must respond. That that gives you a bit of an idea uh, of what's happening in this this letter of Jude. Uh, The the author of this letter, uh, he he has sat down uh, to write about, about something in, important, what does he call it, uh, their, their common salvation, but something much more urgent and uh, much more uh, acute demands his attention. There are Christians who he knows who are under attack. And so as we, as we turn our attention uh, to this letter, we, we will see it's not, it's not so much an, an extended uh, theological treatise uh, as it is a, an urgent SOS letter. This, this, is, a, this is a telegram sent to a, to a ship heading for uh, the rocks. This is an emergency broadcast uh, to a people who are under attack. We're going to look at the, just the opening four verses uh, together tonight, and then the rest of the letter in uh, October. Let's consider these, these four verses by asking uh, three questions. Uh, So three questions, these four verses ask us, uh, and as we consider uh, what we must ask ourselves as well uh, when we are under attack. So the first question then in verses one and two is this, the first question is this, how do you, how do you see yourself? How do you uh, see yourself? Maybe your first instinct when you hear that question is to Think about your, your job, or you think about your, your family relationships, maybe some of the achievements uh, that you've had uh, in life. Um, all of us, we're, we're made up of, of multiple different uh, characteristics, aren't we? Personality traits. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, uh, I'm a son. 
Uh, but I'm also, a, I'm also a student, I'm a, I'm a minister in training, a bit of a coffee snob, I'm a Chelsea fan. Uh, we're, we're made up of all sorts of different things. Um, look at how Jude describes himself in verse 1. Who does he say he is? How does he see himself? He's a, he's a servant of Jesus Christ, and he's a brother of James. And at first reading that, might not seem all that remarkable. I mean, James, his brother James, he, he wrote a New Testament letter. That, that's pretty impressive, I suppose. And he says he's a, he's a servant of, of Jesus. Well, lots of, lots of people in the New Testament would, would call themselves that. What I, what I think is remarkable and worth our attention is, is what he doesn't say. Um, not only is he James's brother, um, Jude has another brother as well. Do, do you know who that is? Do you know who his brother is? Most, most scholars would agree that this, this Jude is the same Jude that's mentioned in Matthew chapter 13. This is the brother of, of Jesus. Yet Jude doesn't, doesn't mention this at all. He is uh, the brother of, of their Savior, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he's content to be viewed as a, as a servant of Christ rather than a sibling of Christ. If you wanted to gain fame in the early Christian church, if you wanted to convince people you were, well, that you were important, surely you would make a great show of this familial relationship. And I want to say, actually, this is one of the points that shows us this letter is authentic. This is a marker of authenticity, a forgery, would, would surely uh, make great pains to, to emphasize this, this sort of biological proximity to the Savior uh, in an effort to, to prove its legitimacy. A, a forgery, in a sense, would, would overplay the hand. But Jude doesn't do that. Because the Jude, the, the real Jude behind this letter, he, he's content uh, to be a servant rather than a sibling of Christ. Something we can, we can really learn here this is, this is someone of high status, intentionally presenting himself as lower. When do we ever see that today? He, he, is, he is lowering himself down in his high status rather than trying to climb up a few rungs of the ladder. When did we last see a, a politician acting with, with deference and, and humility like this? When, when do we see those who, who act in our, in our movies, who write our songs, who, who narrate our, our podcasts? When, when do we see them intentionally present themselves as, as less than they, than they actually are? But then again, when do we do that? Um, I, know, I know my temptation is to be, is to be served rather than, than serve. We all want to be seen as, as greater. Maybe you have a, have a high-powered job with, with lots of staff uh, under you? Or do, do you present yourself as, as a servant or, or as a master uh, to lord over them? Maybe you, maybe you carry an air of, of superiority around you uh, because of the degree you study or the degree that you have, the qualifications you have. Maybe you have friends or, or family in, in positions of high status, of, of high influence. No, notice here that even even the brother of Jesus Christ does not use his position to carry sway. So if you're, if you're elevating yourself above your station, right at the top of this letter, God calls us to humble ourselves. But there's a good chance you're not like that. Maybe you're, maybe you're not arrogant. Maybe you're not particularly proud. Actually, maybe, maybe you're the opposite. Maybe, maybe you re really you have, you have quite a low view of yourself. You need the second half of verse one. You need to see who this letter is, is written to. Look at it with me. To the called, the beloved, and the kept. <coughs> Christian friend, you, you can claim all of those titles for yourself this evening. You have been called by, by God in a, in a gracious 
act of, of initiative as he, as he moves towards you in salvation. You are loved with, with an everlasting love by, by God the Father. You, you are kept, kept safe, kept close to the Father's side until, until the day that the Lord Jesus comes to take you home. Uh, we, we recently, we've been looking after a, a friend's house plant while he's been away traveling. It's not our house plant, but we've kept it for him until he returns. That's, that's a very pale image of, of what is going on here, that kept for in verse one, kept for the Lord Jesus until the day that he returns and he takes us as a people of his very own possession. You see, whether your, your view of yourself is too high and you need to remember that you are a servant or your view of yourself is, is actually too low and you need to remember that you are called, beloved, and, and kept, whether you're in either of those two camps tonight, God's word calls us really to forget ourselves and to be caught up in our new identity in, in Christ Jesus. There's not time to really dive into that idea tonight. Let, let me commend to you a little book, uh, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. It's a fantastic little book uh, that deals more with that idea. All that to say, if you're proud, remember that you're a servant. If you're lowly, remember that you are called loved and kept. But Jude moves on and, and he offers his, his greeting to the recipients. That's verse two. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. These are not just nice words at the top of an email. Um, I trust this email finds you well, or as per my previous email. Um, we will see actually that the recipients of this letter they're going to need all three of these. They're going to need mercy. They will need peace. They will need love uh, when we learn later of what they are facing in this letter. Jude, uh, the author of, of, of this letter, Jude, he, he loves the number three. Um, he loves little, little triads. Uh, this, this is one of them. Uh, mercy, peace, love. And um, We've seen one of them already, haven't we? We've seen called, beloved, and kept. And we'll see, we'll see lots more of them as we, as we move uh, throughout this letter. That's a little quirk of this letter. And I'm no, I'm no uh, mathematician. But if you look at verse 2, what, what does he say? Does he just say, mercy, peace, and love be added to you? No, he, say, he says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And you don't need to be studying maths to know that, that multiplication usually leads to something much bigger than, than addition. And this is, this is a multiplication three times over. So this is not just 100 plus 100 plus 100 gives you 300. This is, this is 100 times 100 times 100 leading to a million. See, this is a prayer that the, the blessings of God would multiply over and, and over in their lives and, and would ultimately lead them to have all the help they need for the fight ahead. Because that's what I said this, this book is about, didn't I? It's, it's, a, it's a wake up call, it's, a, it's, a, it's an SOS letter because there's a fight ahead. And it all begins with getting a right view of ourselves and getting a lot of help from the Lord. So that's our, that's our first question then. How do you view yourself as a, as a servant, as one called, beloved, and kept, as one who needs a lot of help? If that's you tonight, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Our second question then, as we look at verse three, our second question is this, uh, what do you believe? What do you believe? Uh, let, me, let me take you back to my, my very last day uh, as working as a, as a doctor. Um, actually, let me, let me take you back to my very last uh, hour of my very last shift uh, of working as a doctor. I was working in, in the accident emergency uh, in Nine Wells. Uh, incredibly, it, it was empty. Uh, there was no one there. 
Um, and so I thought I would, uh, I would take these last few moments to, um, to reflect on my, on my time working there, maybe to, to chat with some of the staff, find out their, their plans um, for, for next year. I was, I was planning to do that uh, until my, my moment of, of serenity was, was interrupted. A call when I over the tannoy, Dr. Derisus, please, Dr. Derisus. Uh, a patient uh, having, a, having a heart attack had just walked in uh, the front door up to the reception and they needed urgent attention. So my final moments of, of peace, well, they were shattered uh, by someone needing urgent intervention. Jude had plans too, but he had to change them. Verse three is, is worth our attention it's another marker of, of authenticity in this letter. Why start a letter this way if it's not true? I mean, verse three, we're, we're watching real time as an early church leader adapts and responds. He, he was planning, he was, he was very eager actually uh, to write to them about their common salvation. Probably a, a sort of theological explanation of uh, of salvation, of, of what Christ has done for them, of, of who they are in him, something akin to how a lot of maybe Paul's letters start. That's important work. But something prevents him, something urgent had to be dealt with. A, a heart attack has walked into his quiet A&E. And so instead of, of writing this doctrinal letter, he finds it necessary to appeal to them to contend for the faith, to, to contend, to, to struggle uh, to, to defend, like, like an army defending a, an outpost, Jude calls them to, to fight for their faith. This, this contending, this, this is a defense of the faith. It's, it's, it's a holding on to what is true. It's a, it's a conservation of something that is, that is precious. In my, my very brief career as a, as a goalkeeper for my school football team, our, our, our coach, he always said, defending it's harder than attacking. Football is a hard game if you don't have the ball. Because defending, it, it takes more effort, it takes more work uh, than attacking. And it's the same here. Uh, this, this defense, this contending for the faith, it, it's, it's going to take effort. It's going to take grit. It's hard work defending, fighting for the faith. And this, this fighting, it's, it's certainly a it's certainly an internal uh, contending on a, on a personal, on a, on a heart level. Uh, I know I often need to, to hold my, my ground uh, when, we, when we feel those attacks from the outside, when, when we're, um, so those attacks from the inside, when we're, when we're tempted to, to question uh, God's goodness. Maybe we see um, others walk away from the faith. Uh, we see Church leaders uh, stumble and, and, and fall, caught up in, in scandal. We have those internal uh, heart level uh, contentions that we have to make. But, but this, this passage, it's, actually, it's more getting at those attacks from the, from the outside, uh, those attacks from, from other people, uh, the need to uh, contend from the faith uh, when those are around us are attacking the gospel and attacking our Lord. And that's hard work. And that takes, takes a lot of effort. Defending is, after all, harder than attacking. And that might mean if whenever you are in the staff room and, and you hear someone joking uh, about Christians, ranting about what they're like, uh, that might mean you, you stepping up and saying, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. Um, I'm, we're not all like, like, like that. Or, or maybe in your, in your lecture hall, if someone makes, it, makes a joke about, about the Lord Jesus, taking, taking that moment to say, well, actually, I'm, I'm a Christian and I actually worship Jesus. And, and you may well find that in that, in that hard, that uncomfortable, that risky moment, actually, people, people respect that, Pe people are open to that, people may well want to know more uh, about what you're saying because what is it exactly we are contending for in verse 3? We need to contend for, for what? For, for the faith. What exactly is that faith 
that, that, that Jude is talking about. How does, how does Jude describe it? What, what does he call it in verse 3? He calls it the faith that was once delivered for all the saints. Our faith has been handed down. It has been delivered to us. We, we are in a, a long line of, of believers. The Old Testament saints, they looked ahead to, to the Lord Jesus. The apostles of, of the New Testament, they, they bear witness about the Lord Jesus. And now that, that witness, that, that faith has been passed down, it has been delivered to, to those who believe. The faith spoken of here then really is, is just the content of, of the gospel message. The faith is really the, the gospel. Which brings me back to the, to the question that this, this verse, this verse 3 is asking us, what, what do you believe? What do you really believe? Because every, everyone has a faith they believe in, a, a, a message they subscribe to, a, a dogma they hold. What, what's, the, what's the gospel of Dundee? What's the, what's the gospel of, of 21st century Scotland? Maybe it goes a bit something like this. Do whatever you want, as long as it doesn't hurt someone. You can be uh, whatever you want to be. Uh, the meaning of life is to find your own meaning. But we, but we say things as well, don't we? Things like, you do you, or um, your health is your wealth. We say things like that, don't we? Um, are you tempted to, to, to believe those messages as well? I mean, we are, we're surrounded by them. They're, they're everywhere, aren't they? They're, they're in our books. They're, they're in our, our TV shows. They're on our news websites. Friends, messages like this, these are attacks on the gospel message. These are attacks on, on the faith that Jude is describing here. We must contend for the faith that tells a, that tells a better story, that, that, that presents the, the true reality of, of how things really are. I mean, our, our, what does our gospel say? The gospel says, don't, don't do what you want, but whatever you do, work is for the Lord, not for man. The gospel says, don't, don't live however you, you want to live, but put sin to death in you that you might live in the way God has intended. The meaning of life, it's not to search for, for meaning for yourself, but the meaning of life well, is, to, is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So what do you believe? Are you contending for the faith, for the faith once for all delivered? Or are you giving ground to the gospel of Dundee? the gospel of self-gratification. Which brings me to our, our last question. Um, how do you view yourself? What do you believe? And finally, in verse four, who is, who is influencing you? Who is influencing you? Jude, he tells us that the reason he's had to, to urgently change the content of his, of his letter, that's what verse four is all about. It's, it's, it's vivid imagery, isn't it? When you look at it, there are these shady, shadowy figures that have crept into the church. There's some, some disagreement about who uh, exactly these people are, but, it, but it's more than likely that they're, they're false teachers. Uh, they may well be um, itinerant prophets who are, who are going around spreading a, a false message, and they've crept in unnoticed, and they've caught the congregation off guard, and now they're, they're, they're wreaking havoc with uh, this message that they bring. But although the, the church was caught off guard, God was not caught off guard. They do not creep in unnoticed to him. In fact, God, God knew they would appear. False, false teachers, the outcome that they, they would face, that was something that was predicted long ago by, by the prophets 
and by the apostles. That's what that middle section of verse 4 is, this condemnation they were designated for or, or marked out for. That will be uh, described more in the, in the next section of, of Jude, and we'll, we'll look at that in the next sermon. For now, I want you to notice another one of those little, little triads that, that Jude loves Look at how he describes those false teachers in verse 4. They are ungodly, they pervert grace, and they deny Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, there's a logic to that little triad. Just, just follow it with me carefully. Follow the logic here. Because their lack of concern for God, their ungodliness, means that they live um, however they want to, and their lifestyle, that lifestyle of living however they want, it demonstrates a denial of Christ's lordship. So by taking God out of the equation, uh, they find license in their, in their lives uh, to live, what does it say, uh, a life, live a life of sensuality, just indulging the senses, giving in to the senses. And a life like that, well, it makes it clear that, that Jesus is not their master. And these are supposed to be teachers of God's word. So for Jude, their failure to, to live a, a moral life, really it puts the gospel at stake. But by living openly in, in sin, they're, they're making a mockery of Christ's kingship and skewing what the gospel of grace is really about. So as we conclude, uh, let me ask uh, again that question, who is, who is influencing you? Or maybe I can sharpen it just, just a little bit, a uh, bit more in line with this verse. What, what are the people who, who influence you really like? Do, do you know what their, what their character is? Um, a, few, a few years ago, Sarah and I listened to a, to a podcast series, some of you may know it, um, called, called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Uh, it recounts the, the events uh, surrounding the rise of a, of a church in America called, called Mars Hill and it, its subsequent uh, downfall. It's a tremendously made podcast, I, I recommend it to you. Uh, it's full of, of interviews with, with, with dozens and dozens of people who... who who were saved through that church, um, who, who were really involved in its, in its church plants. But they also bear witness to uh, the character of the leader uh, of that church. Anger, uh, arrogance, uh, lies, all, all of these were, they were just brushed off as eccentricities, as, as personality quirks. After all, I mean, the, the, the church was growing uh, people are being saved. How, how would anyone want to, to speak out against that or, or get in the way? Uh, that, that minister, he, he described the church as a bus that, that everybody was getting onto, um, but, it, but he failed to see the significance of, of the pile of bodies that he, that he was leaving behind as he ran over and, and crushed and, and knocked over um, people in his way because of his actions. I say all that because I want to tell you tonight that, that in church leadership and those who preach and those who lead, it should never be said of them, oh, well, he was, he was flirtatious and he was impatient and he was unkind, but, but wasn't he a great preacher? Or, or she was really angry. She was, she was boorish. She was intimidating, but, but she really got things done. See, moral failures like, like this, they, they deny the lordship of Jesus Christ over, over all of our life. And so when we are looking to our influencers, we should look for those who embrace Christ's lordship, not reject it. We should look to those who, who know that, that Jesus is, is master of their life. Of course, we don't, we don't make idols in this life, do we? But, but we can have heroes. We can have people we, we look up to. You could read a, a biography of a, of a Christian missionary, long since deceased. You could listen to interviews with faithful Christians. You could, you could talk to an elderly saint in this church who's been through it all before. 
And I promise you, every one of them will tell you that ultimately you must be influenced by the Lord Jesus. He must be Lord and Master of your life. Because after all, what wasn't, wasn't he uh, the greatest uh, leader, the greatest counselor, the greatest preacher who ever lived? He was always patient, loving, concerned for others. He, he treated those who were least with the, with the greatest dignity. He demonstrated the, the grace of, of God and his treatment of others. We, we know exactly what he is like from his word. He should be our ultimate influence. He should always be the one we look to for help. He, he is the one that we should look to replicate. But isn't he so much more than that? He is, what, what does Jude say at the end of verse four? He is master and Lord of our lives. He has bought you with his blood if you are a Christian here tonight. He has died on the cross for your sins. He has risen from the grave. He has ascended into heaven and he has done that for you. And he calls you now to follow him. And so will you allow him to tell you who you really are? Called, beloved, kept. Will you, will you believe in him and his gospel, the faith that has been handed down? And will you trust him in all circumstances? Will you trust him with your life? Because Jude tells us that the, the fight is on, but praise be to the Lord Jesus that we know the outcome is secure. See, the conqueror has risen. So let us fight with, with confidence and with faith in him for every battle. Let's look to him now as we pray together. Let's pray.